that matters because the decisions we make in the coming days and weeks will set a course that will determine whether the next generation of British people inherit a stronger and more confident nation. The Conservative Party was elected with a large majority, so it falls to us to decide who carries the flag forward in this Parliament. But it is not a decision that should be made behind closed doors with no input from the public. From the beginning, I wanted this campaign to be more than just a case for my leadership. I also wanted it to be a moment where the party and the country came together. Before I talk about the campaign, I want to say something about how we got here. I want to talk about Boris Johnson. As candidates to replace him, we owe it to the British people who elected Boris as Prime Minister in 2019 to explain why he is leaving office. There is something wrong about a process that sees a sitting Prime Minister replaced while the people doing the replacing pull the curtains and act like it's nobody's business but theirs. It's everybody's business. So let me tell you how I see it. Boris Johnson is one of the most remarkable people I have ever met. And whatever some commentators may say, he has a good heart. Did I disagree with him? Frequently. Is he flawed? Yes. And so are the rest of us. Was it no longer working? Yes. And that's why I resigned. But let me be clear, I will have no part in a rewriting of history that seeks to demonize Boris, exaggerate his faults, or deny his efforts. Yeah. We know his achievements, breaking the Brexit deadlock, winning a stunning election victory, rolling out a world-class vaccination program, and standing up for a free Ukraine when other leaders were still wringing their hands. Yeah. Some people might advise that I should avoid saying all of this in case it alienates people, but that wouldn't be honest. If telling you what I think, positive and negative, costs me the leadership, so be it. Since I declared, a few short days ago, the response has been, well, overwhelming. Beyond my imagination, thousands of volunteers have reached out to join our campaign because they have heard a message of change. I am running a positive campaign focused on what my leadership can offer our party and our country. I will not engage in the negativity that you may have seen and read in the media if others wish to do that, then let them. That's not who we are. We can be better. Yeah. Because I look across the field of candidates and I see colleagues and friends. I see people I admire and respect, people with exceptional qualities. I want to say to all of them, we are still part of the same Conservative family. And when this election is over, we're going to work together for the British people. Yeah. But before that, we have to resolve some disagreements, incredibly important disagreements about the nature and depth of our challenges that the country faces and the right response to them. A pandemic that all but broke the world economy, a war in mainland Europe, and most visibly at home now, a global spike in inflation that has risen to levels not seen since the 70s and 80s. When confronted with challenges so fundamental, the right place to start is with your values. And my values, traditional conservative values, are clear. Hard work, patriotism, fairness, a love of family, pragmatism, but also an unshakable belief 
that we can build a better future. Yeah. Values, values that compel me to say it is completely unacceptable in this country that too many women and girls do not enjoy the same freedom most men take for granted in feeling safe from assault and abuse that our natural environment is an inheritance we preserve and protect for future generations, yeah. and that at a time of rising global instability, we have a responsibility to the world to provide leadership. That is why, as Chancellor, I prioritised record funding for the armed services, who represent the best of our country and do heroic work. Yeah. But as vital as values are, they are not enough. We need to have a grown-up conversation about the central policy question that all candidates have to answer in this election. Do you have a credible plan to protect our economy and get it growing? My message to the party and the country is simple. I have a plan to steer our economy through these headwinds. We need a return to traditional conservative economic values. And that means honesty and responsibility, not fairy tales. Yeah. It, it is not credible to promise lots more spending and lower taxes. I had to make some of the most difficult choices of my life as Chancellor, in particular how to deal with our debt and borrowing after COVID. I have never hidden away from those. I certainly won't pretend now the choices I made and the things I voted for were somehow not necessary. And whilst that may be politically inconvenient for me, it is also the truth. As is the fact that once we've gripped inflation, I will get the tax burden down. It is a question of when, not if. Yeah. And I will achieve this because I have a clear plan to get our economy growing quickly. We need to implement the radical reforms I set out as Chancellor to the way businesses are taxed to make our country the best place in the world to invest more, train more, and critically to innovate more. We need to use the new freedoms Brexit has given us and the new mentality it can give us to reform the mass of regulations, bureaucracy and constraints that too often get in the way. We need to build a new consensus on people coming to our country. Yes to hard-working, talented, innovators, but crucially, control of our borders. And we need to transform the performance and productivity of our public services by integrating technology, empowering good leaders, and caring much more about what actually works than what sounds good. I believe we can build a better, smaller, 21st century government that helps to support growth and countries around the world seek to emulate. Now, if we do all of this, we will get our economy growing quickly again, not just for a short burst, but sustainably for generations to come. This is the surest path to tax cuts that work, to keeping our schools and NHS strong, to properly funding our armed forces and keeping our country safe. So that is my plan. Tackle inflation, grow the economy, and cut taxes. It is a long-term approach that will deliver long-term gains for families and businesses across the United Kingdom. I am prepared to give everything I have in service to our nation, to restore trust, rebuild our economy, and reunite the country. I want to have a grown-up conversation where I can tell you the truth. A better future is not given, it is earned. That is why I am standing to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and your Prime Minister. Thank you.
Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I think we're going to take some questions both from the audience and a few from the media. So apparently the first question is Roberto. Where, Roberto, where might you be? Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Roberto. I'm a local councillor here in London um, and a party volunteer. Rishi, we've got some real challenges ahead, as you mentioned, inflation, the war in Ukraine, recovering from COVID. How are you going to take us through all of that and bring us back together as a party and as a country? Roberto, well, first of all, thank you for what you do locally. And you're right. We do have some big challenges ahead of us. And I think if we want to start dealing with them, the first thing we have to be is honest that they exist. We have to recognize the scale of the challenges we face and be honest with the country about that. We can't pretend that they're easy or that they're not there. And what it requires is serious leadership to tackle them. And that's what I believe I can offer. I believe that we can restore trust. We can rebuild our economy and protect the most vulnerable as we do so. And we can reunite the country. And I know I can do it with your help. So thank you. Right, next from the media, we, we've got Chris, Chris Mason from the BBC. So Chris, hi. Good morning, Chris Mason, BBC News. Uh, day after day, so many of your colleagues have sought to demolish your record as chancellor. Do you have the stomach for what's to come? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, well I'm, I'm standing here today surrounded by friends and colleagues, uh, which I've been. Yeah. And Chris, that, that's what gives me the optimism, the confidence to do this. I, I want to run an entirely positive campaign. As I said in my speech, I have enormous respect for my colleagues, my friends who are running in this contest. And the most important thing to remember is we're all part of the same Conservative family. And when this is said and done, we're going to come together and we're going to get back to serving the British people. And I'm looking forward to doing that with them. All right, next. We've got Carl from ITV. Carl, where are you? I'm going to oh, go well, next. I, right, is that OK? Oh, oh, oh Carl, oh, there you are. Oh. <laughs> I'm coming to you, Beth. I'm coming to you. Don't worry. Um, uh, Rishi, you've painted a picture of yourself as being as loyal as you could have been to Boris Johnson. But really, if you didn't believe that you were less flawed than Boris Johnson, you wouldn't be standing here, would you? Can you just spell out? why you thought it wasn't working and you had to quit. Well, Carl, you, you would have seen my resignation letter and where I explained that. But it wasn't an easy decision. It was an incredibly difficult and sad decision because I've worked closely with Boris and loyally for over two, almost two and a half years. And you know, when it came to it, though, as I've said in my letter, there were just some things that were becoming too difficult uh, for me to, to keep working with him on. But you heard what I said in the speech about my views on Boris and I meant them 100%. But you suggested that he was no more flawed than anyone else. Is that what you believe? I think we're, we're, we're all flawed. I think there's not, not a single leading politician who can stand here and say that we're perfect. You know, all of us have our strengths and weaknesses. And you know, our job is to talk about what we can offer the country as candidates, positively and optimistically. That's what I'm doing today. I'm sure my colleagues will do the same. Uh, as I said, we're all part of the same family. We should be proud of the things that we've done that have made a difference to this country. I am. I'm proud to have been part of a government that did all those things that I talked about. And I'm proud that the Prime Minister provided the leadership to do those things. Yeah. Go on, Beth. Here we go. My turn. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, Rishi Sunak, you, you've just stood here and said Boris Johnson's a remarkable person. You don't want history to demonise him. But the fact is uh, that the party's just ousted him on the basis of conduct, probity, and causing division. And here you are. And I have to put it to you that you have a police fine over Partygate, and there have been questions too over your very wealthy family avoiding paying millions of pounds in tax due to your wife being a non-DOM taxpayer. Now, that, I know, arrangement has changed, but that was until very recently. And I have to say you're an utterly corrosive figure in the parliamentary party for a big chunk of it. So I put it to you. I have, I, I have, I ha, I'm sorry, but there are, me, I am, I, I, there, there are many in the party uh, that do not want you to be prime minister. You know that. So I put it to you that you're not a clean start, that you might be more of the same. Well, <laughs> 
Beth, look, th thank you for the question. And I think it's important that we do, whoever wins this election does restore trust, because trust has been broken, and we need to rebuild all of that with the country. That's why it's something that I'm keen to do as leader. And I think I, I can do that. And it's about the conduct of government, which is important. And you can expect that that's the kind of leadership I'll provide. Uh, but you know, with regard to the parliamentary party, you can look around. You can see who's here. What has really humbled me and given me an enormous amount of encouragement is the breadth of support uh, from people from, uh, from it's from all wings of the party it's from all regions of the party and that's why I believe I'm best placed to bring the party back together but also reunite the country because ultimately that's the most important thing we want to bring the country together and I believe I can do that Some of the issues around your green card, uh, your wife's non-DOM tax status, these are going to be issues that Labour are going to be able to use against the Conservatives in the next election about character of the Prime Minister, aren't they? They're problems in your closet. Well, I mean, we actually, they've all, they're all out there and we've discussed them and we addressed them in Easter. I referred myself, as you know, to Lord Guite, who wrote uh, and described my behaviour and conduct as meticulous and there were absolutely no conflicts or anything like that and my wife made her own statement at the time and I respect her decisions to do that and I fully respect her decisions going forward uh, and of course I will continue to ensure that we have very high standards in public office, that's what people rightly should expect from their leaders, that's what I will provide. Yeah. Right. I think, okay, perfect. I I think that's, that, that's all we've got time for now. I'm sure we'll be doing this lots more. Right? Well, I've, got, I've got a bunch of people waiting for me next door. But well, we have actually how we could do one from you quickly and then Nissi will get mad at me, but then I'm going to be late for these next things. Go on. Thank you. You're standing to be the next Prime Minister. You can take a couple of questions from some journalists. Um, I, uh, Mr. Sunak. Dominic Cummings has been openly campaigning to make you the Prime Minister for almost a year now. Are you grateful for his support and will there be a job in Downing Street for him in your administration? And one more if I may, given we're, we have only got you for a little while. Last week the Prime Minister pledged to, uh, uh, to increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP by the end of this decade. Will you continue with that vow in office if you win? And if so, why did you ignore repeated warnings this year? that Britain will miss the crucial NATO percent target of 2% on defence spending? OK, two, you know, two excellent questions, Harry, so thanks for asking them. So, look, firstly, on Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings had had, has had absolutely nothing to do with this campaign and will have absolutely nothing to do with any government that I'm privileged to lead. Yeah. Um, and and for, for the record, I have not communicated with uh, Dominic Cummings since the day that he left Downing Street. So I just want to make sure that's clear, and thank you for asking it. And look, on, on defence spending, you know, what, what can I say? I'd say, look, first of all, I view our NATO target as a uh, floor and not a ceiling, so that's something that I can absolutely commit to. Uh, and also, the most important thing to know is our defence spending is already forecast to grow to around 2.5% over time as a result of the investments that we're making in things like our future combat air system uh, and AUKUS and, and others. But the way I think about it is not to think about defence spending through arbitrary targets, because actually what's the most important thing is making sure that this country is protected against the threats that it's based. So my approach to defence spending will be threat-based, uh, and that's not about an arbitrary number, that's making sure that we make the investments to protect ourselves, to keep ourselves safe, and if you look at my record, I was... <laughs> We need to have a grown-up conversation about where we are, how we got here, and what we intend to do about it. It's a conversation for those of us gathered here in this room today and the Conservative Party more widely. But above all, it's a conversation we need to have with the British people. And it starts with being honest with each other. That matters because the decisions we make in the coming days and weeks will set a course that will determine whether the next generation of British people inherit a stronger and more complex